Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. An obscure Jewish sect follows the teachings of a heretical prophet who claims he is the son of God. How did the cult of Christ withstand the might of the Roman Empire and then become its ally? The rise of the church, this time on the Western tradition. UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. Last time we ended at the dawn of Christianity when Christ and his disciples were preaching to their fellow Jews a sort of reformed Judaism. Where the long tradition of the Hebrew prophets promised the coming of a Messiah who would establish the kingdom of God on earth, Jesus seems to have preached that there would be no kingdom, but instead a day of judgment coming very soon when the wicked would be punished and the righteous rewarded. And so the message was, abandon all sin while you still have time. This was definitely a departure from orthodoxy, but even so, there was no thought of separateness in Christian communities until, that is, St. Paul came along. Paul was a Roman citizen born in the city of Tarsus in Asia Minor. He was a rabbi and a Pharisee, in other words, a very pious Jew, and as a pious Jew, he persecuted Christians whom he regarded as heretics and a menace to Judaism. But around 35 AD, five years after the crucifixion of Christ, Paul had a vision on the road to Damascus, and he became convinced that Jesus was the Son of God. Here is a 15th century version of Paul's conversion. Paul turned out to be the great organizer, the great public relations manager of the young faith, and in effect he made Christianity competitive with other religions. He enlarged its scope by recruiting outside the restricted group of people who obeyed Jewish law. He admitted non-Jews without asking them to be circumcised first. And without insisting they respect the ritual laws, especially the laws concerning food, he probably did it because he was in a hurry. The end of the world was coming and you couldn't quibble over trifles. But it's worth remembering that Paul and his like were able to spread Christianity because of Roman roads and Roman peace, as well as his skill and the religion's appeal. It was Rome that linked the Mediterranean world together. Equally important was the Koine, the Greek's common dialect which spread from east to west, making all the Mediterranean a bilingual world where traveling men could make themselves understood everywhere. St. Paul wrote to the Romans in Greek, and until early in the 3rd century AD, the language of Christian liturgy in the Church of Rome was Greek. It was also into Greek that the Hebrew scriptures had been translated two centuries before Christ. That extremely important translation was finished in Hellenistic Alexandria with its great Jewish community. It was called the Septuagint, from the Latin for 70, because there were supposed to have been 70 translators. And so it was ready for early Christian missionaries when they began to carry their message through the world. In the synagogues, which you could find in Hellenistic cities like this one, Adura Europos, 
the translations of the Hebrew scriptures were read and studied. And I don't think the early Christian church would have gone very far, or Paul either, without the Septuagint and the synagogue, and without writing the New Testament in the Greek koine from the very beginning. So here you have a crucial interconnection of factors. First, the conquests of the Roman Empire which unify the Mediterranean world. Second, the Hellenistic creation of a common speech for this world. Both were preconditions for the advance of Christianity. However, as time went on, the Jews became increasingly hostile to Christians, and the Christians also became more and more hostile to the Jews. To the Jews, the Christians were heretics. To the Christians, the Jews were willfully blind to what was so evident and so evidently holy. And so Christianity separated from Judaism. It left the fairly straightforward path of Jewish religious thought and moving westward along both shores of the Mediterranean, it started to appeal to a new public and to develop a theology of its own. This advance of Christianity was spurred in the second half of the first century by a great Jewish rising against Rome and a wave of anti-Semitism that swept over the East about the same time. But then the Roman general Titus put down the uprising and sacked the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. This is the Roman procession with the spoils of Jerusalem. At this point, the Christians were still pretty much a Jewish sect and they were emotionally affected by the humiliating defeat. But then two things happened. On the one hand, a lot of Christians were left with an abiding hatred of secular power. On the other hand, as you can tell from this coin with the inscription Judea taken captive, established Jewish communities and the power of Orthodox Jewish religion temporarily collapsed so the Christians found it easier to break free. The earthly Jerusalem had been destroyed so that now the ideal version could be better projected into heaven without having to worry about real nations and real governments. The result of all this can be found in the suggestion made by Origen a Christian teacher who lived in Alexandria in the third century. Origen wrote that Christians should not take part in the government of the state, but that their only concern should be the divine nation, that is, the church. Some churchmen went even further, denying the world and their own bodies, which in the dichotomy between spirit and flesh came out a poor second. They gave away their property, they fasted, they flagellated themselves, and Origen advocated complete chastity, probably had himself castrated. If the church had heeded Origen, its story would have ended there. But fortunately, St. Paul suggested it was better to marry than to burn. Still, the unworldly anti-secular ideas of origin remained influential, and as the Roman Empire disintegrated, churchmen looked on with some detachment. They exercised their talents in bitter theological controversies and in the spread of monastic communities like this one in Greece, cut off from the wicked world where Christians could concentrate on personal salvation and spend their lives in contemplation and penitence. It can be argued, and it was argued even at the time, that this attitude was a sort of sour grapes, a retreat from the world when the world became too hard to bear, denying earthly values in order to secure oneself against their loss. It can also be argued, however, that when you deny certain values, you are, at least by implication, you are affirming alternative values. But to many people of that time, even this positive aspect looked uncommonly like a negative one. 
and to understand this, we have to imagine what these early Christians looked like to the respectable property owners of the first three centuries after Christ. To begin with, many people thought the Christians were crazy or drunk. The resurrection of Christ and the ascension were incompatible with natural science, and for a late pagan intellectual to accept the incarnation of God in the human form as Jesus would be like a modern man denying the evolution of species. He would have to abandon not just the most advanced rational knowledge available, but by implication the whole Greco-Roman culture that had been marked by that knowledge. But the ultimate accusation was the one that the high priest brings to the Roman governor against St. Paul when he complains, we have found this man to be a pestilent fellow and a mover of sedition among all the Jews throughout the world and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And this is the point. These Christians are dangerous. They insist that all men are brothers, that the beggar is as good as the solid citizen, that the slave is equal to his master in essence, if not in fact, since this doesn't prevent Christians from keeping slaves. All in all, they deny the value of everything society holds dear. The good shepherd offers salvation, not money, or family, or property, or success, or service to the state. Leave thy father and thy mother and thy brother and follow me. What good will all this do you if you have lost your own soul? What was even worse, the Christians even denied the final power of the emperor and the ultimate value and worth of imperial power and imperial justice. By all means, render unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, but there's a limit to what belongs to Caesar, and this means that for the Christians, there is a higher power than the state. There is an ultimate good or aim which may not be the ultimate good or aim of the state. And if that aim, God's aim, clashes with that of Caesar, there is no doubt about whom the Christian must follow. Think for a minute of the revolutionary character of such ideas being spread around a society where material values reign supreme, ideas which found particular favor with the proletariat, especially around the ports and the Levantine cities. It's a society where gods like Diana here, were anthropomorphic with human form and personality, where the emperor was God, where imperial unity called increasingly for religious unity and for the subordination of private opinions to the state. So Christians were dangerous and they were subversive because their success threatened not just the state but the whole established, accepted basis of social life and social values. When Christ says, my kingdom is not of this world, he means that the world is irrelevant, which challenges every stoic notion of civic duty. When he says, Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God means the end of politics on earth, insofar as you define politics as a reasonable attempt to organize human society. On the other hand, a lot of what the Christians said could have fitted the Stoic tradition. The focus on individual salvation, the heavenly city, to which the pure and high-minded aspire, the rejection of social or national differences, above all the high moral values, they all sounded familiar 
or they could be made to sound familiar. And so, on another level, did the mystic aspect of Christianity and its promise of a special revelation, a special road to salvation, just like the other so-called mystery religions, the cults of Mithras, of Isis, and so on. But the real secret weapon of the Christian was that they soon developed a tight-knit, disciplined organization that stretched all over the empire. It all began with the fact that Christians had a book, the Bible, full of potent promises and stories of miracles that bore out the tales attested to by people who were practically contemporaries. The Christians, being a practical group, meeting and reading and having discussions about the Gospels, took advantage of Roman respect for tombs to organize themselves legally as burial societies. And this is one of their catacombs, their underground burial tunnels. This meant that even when the authorities persecuted the Christians, they generally respected their catacombs, at least until the third century, when the Christians were already pretty well organized. There was also the fact that while Christianity was just as mysterious as any other mystery cult, it was much cheaper to join. Initiation as a worshiper of Mithras called for a bull. Initiation into the cult of Isis called for a whole series of gifts and sacrifices. But if you wanted to worship Christ, there were no initial expenses, and most church meetings were rather like highly emotional Sunday school picnics. It was pleasant, and it was economical. But if you wanted to, and you probably did want to, you could give alms to the church. By the third century, the church had become rich. Alms giving was a judicious transfer of capital from this world to the next, a sort of fire insurance. These contributions and legacies accumulated in the hand of the bishops and were devoted almost exclusively to charity and not just for Christians either. You can imagine what a tremendous lever of power this Christian charity must have been as the imperial Roman organization disintegrated, as misery increased, as the great cities crowded with starving poor, as men were thrown out of work or off their lands by barbarians or nobles or tax collectors. And the Christian bishops who controlled the arms were often the only honest men around or the only honest, powerful men around. The provincial governors and other magistrates were mostly blue-blooded ninnies appointed for a year or two to act as the figurehead of an ill-paid and hence corruptible staff. And so in the third century, the bishop stands out as a permanent figure in his town, dedicated to his job, to his flock, and responsible only to God. And then by the next century, he also offers something everybody wants, a free, quick, uncorrupt settlement of lawsuits by arbitration. And this is sought by pagans and heretics as much as it is by Christians. So the church became a force to be reckoned with until by the 4th century it was officially recognized by the Roman state. That happened after yet another civil war between rivals to the throne of the empire ended with the victory of Constantine, who enlisted the support of the Christians against his chief opponent, his opponent who worshipped Sol Invictus, the invincible son, as most soldiers did then. Constantine, who was emperor from 306 to 337, was given to visions and conversions. He had shifted from one god to another before. 
This time, however, a vision told him that the sign of the cross would bring him victory. And so he put the cross on his banner and on the shields of his soldiers, and it worked. In 312, Constantine defeated his chief rival, Maxentius, at the Milvian Bridge near Rome. And soon after this, his Edict of Milan granted full toleration to the Church and freedom of worship to all Christians. It also established an alliance between the Christian Church and the Roman State that was going to last a very long time. Within a few decades, tolerance for Christians turned into the right for Christians to be intolerant of any other faith or church and to tear down temples like this temple of Artemis in Jordan. Around 400, public paganism was suppressed, the temples were closed everywhere, the statues broken up, often by Christian mobs, and the proud inscriptions proclaiming the unshakable alliance of cities and their gods were carted away to pave the public highways. For the Jews during this period, there were pogroms, organized massacres which enlisted the anti-Semitism of the urban Greeks in the cause of God. For the pagans, there was the closing of the schools, the closing of temples, persecution, sometimes lynchings, as happened with Hypatia, a distinguished lady of Alexandria who went in for philosophy and mathematics. As described by Edward Gibbon, the historian who didn't like early Christians very much, Hypatia was torn from her chariot, stripped naked, dragged to the church, and inhumanely butchered by a troop of savage, merciless fanatics. Her flesh was scraped from the bones with sharp oyster shells, and her quivering limbs were delivered to the flames. The just progress of inquiry and punishment was stopped by seasonable gifts. Thus, given. By the time this happened in 415, the Christians were reserving most of their passion for fighting each other, and they invested far more fury and energy in persecuting fellow Christians than they did in hurting non-Christians, especially as non-Christians were becoming ever more scarce. What you get now is the clash of groups holding strong views on things like diet, marriage, property, clothing, which could and often did lead to violence. Above all, you get doctrinal discord about the Trinity. The union of the Father, the Son and the Holy Ghost, which is a difficult concept anyway, and especially about the nature of Christ himself. Is Christ a man who becomes God? Is he a God who temporarily becomes a man? Is he a God who is God and man at the same time? And is he equal to God the Father or subordinate as a son should be? This may sound like hair splitting, but a lot of blood was shed and a lot of people suffered for each of these views. Rival doctrines also became associated with this region or that. They became part of what we might call a national or tribal identity. For example, the city of Constantinople stood for a Christian god who combines two natures in one. Alexandria stood for one nature only. From then on, when one province or people or political party fought another, it would very often be as orthodox against heretic on behalf of one doctrine or another. As long as Christians had been part of an alternative society, their shrines had been harbors in a world ruled by demonic powers. But now, 
the alternative to society had become the society. The shrines proclaimed the greatness of God and of his church, and they also provided arenas where battles between Christians could be fought out. The Christian himself had been an athlete in Christ, committed to a wrestling match, an agon, as the Greeks called it, a match against evil and darkness and his own lower nature. Now that the churches were full, he could wrestle against those whose idea of truth, especially Christian truth, was different from his own. And this was to bring centuries of conflict, as we shall see in the programs ahead. <laughs> Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.